to you all on a quite chilly night out there, but it's been quite a beautiful day. Uh, a very special event that I'm really honoured and tough to be asked to host this evening on behalf of the Canaries Trust. It is our mental health forum. It is the time to talk today. Uh, and when we planned it, we didn't realise we'd be in the third national lockdown <laughs> and in the fifth week of that, no less. So uh, I hope you're all OK. I hope you're all doing all right. Uh, we're going to have um, a, a full and frank discussion this evening. Um, I, I think very few things will be off limits. Um, you're welcome to put questions to the panel uh, anonymously. You can do that in the question and answer session, which is at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to type questions into the chat as well. We'll get through as many as we possibly can. We've had a few already, so, uh, so we'll crack on with it. Um, and just to say, obviously, you know, we are all lovely people, all of us, all of you, all of us. Uh, so just to keep things nice and um, friendly and supportive and loving and caring like we are as Norwich City fans, that's what we are. Not to other teams in the league at the moment because we are top of the league and having a laugh. We are obviously not being very caring and supportive to them. Ha 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 ha, we're enjoying that. Um, so yes, but do keep it uh, nice and bright and positive and supportive to people if you can please. I know it's a, a difficult time. Uh, at the end, we will be giving you some advice and resources as well, and you can get in touch with the Canaries Trust mental health team, and they'll point you in the direction of, of some extras too. So, uh, a very warm welcome from all of us. Um, my name is Karen Buchanan. I'm a Norwich City fan, first and foremost, and a lecturer at City College uh, Norwich. Uh, secondly, where I teach media to students, um, and I've written about football and things in the past. Um, and yeah, lockdown, hey, week five, going great. Loving it, loving it, loving it. So I'm looking forward to picking up lots of tips from you guys um, because we have a wonderful panel for you this evening. Um, I'm so, so chuffed. I, I'm just I'm really excited by this. Um, so can you give me a very warm welcome, please, to uh, Chris Reeve, the social media supremo uh, at Talk Norwich City. Hello. Hello, good evening, Karen, how are you doing? I'm, I'm not too bad, thank you. I have to say, I'm not too bad, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, 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 very good, thank you. Really looking forward to tonight and um, hopefully give our audience a lot of value. Good, good, good. Uh, we're going to start off in a minute by asking a little question about football. Somebody asked us about how football is uh, helping us support our mental health during the lockdown. Um, I have to say, at various times in the past, it hasn't helped me with my mental health, but right now, Pretty good. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so, so just briefly, what, what about yourself with football? Is it uh, is it really helping you through this this period in in time? And we're putting a little poll up for you, so everyone can uh, can have a, a word and, and explain what they think. So, how much has lockdown and not being able to watch the Canaries live impacted upon your mental health? Uh, yes, no, not sure. Not going to games has improved my mental health. Okay. So um, I have to say, watching the, um, the game on Tuesday night um, without any commentary, I tuned into you guys at the end, I did, um, but I did make mistake of paying my, my iPhone money and, uh, and, and listening to, um, well, the tube trains, basically, which was very sad and, and made me a bit upset, but uh, top of the league is good. So what about you? What about you, Chris? Sorry, sorry, Karen, I, I missed part of that. So, what, do you mean, what, sorry? what about you and your mental health with the football at the moment? How is it been for you? It's, it's absolutely, uh, it's, to be honest with you, it's absolutely essential. And one of the whole reasons why we've, we've started the TNC Watch Along is to ensure that we are uh, getting together the, the, the Norwich City community because everyone is missing belting out the, the, the chants in the Barclay, uh, in the Snake Pit, in the whole of the stadium. And uh, we really wanted to bring that together online. So, um, yeah, like, I think the key thing that we've all missed, right, is community, getting together, that 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 human-to-human -human interaction. So we've really tried to uh, bring together as, as much of that online discussion as possible and making it super clear to people that, you know, um, you know, we're always a DM away, always happy to talk. Um, but, yeah, like, it's hugely helped uh, me, you know, get together with Norwich fans, and without it, I, I, I don't know how I would have um, coped, to be honest with you. I found it incredibly difficult. So, um, yeah, I'm very grateful that, that we've managed to keep the, the Norwich City community together and managed to raise some money for Big C, a fantastic local charity as well. So 
I, I've kind of, I, we, we're trying to thrive and not just survive. I mean, that sounds a bit corny, but um, I think that, that Norwich City fans, you know, can, can show just how, how much of a powerful, impactful, strong and positive fan base we are um, by, by, by getting together online. Um, with that comes some, some bad things too. It means that um, all of the, the, the venting of a poor performance is, 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 is put out on social media. Um, that certainly impacts our, our, our players as well as um, supporters, and, and I'm sure we'll we'll get onto that um, t- tonight, Karen, in various different forms. So, um, yeah, as I say, really excited to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And um, if anyone's got any questions for me any time, feel free to um, ask me in the Excellent. chat. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you as as we go on. Uh, hello to Kelvin, who says Talk Norwich City has been my go-to podcast for the last few weeks. Really helped fill some hours and offered a great insight. So, really good job, Chris. Well done. Thank you. Um, I also love to introduce uh, Clive Cook, who's the head of player care at Norwich City Football Club. Hello, Clive. Welcome. Um, how has it been for you? Different perspective, uh, I'm sure. Personally or professionally or both? Both, actually. Yeah. yeah. Be interesting. Oh, sorry, I mean, first of all, good evening to, to everyone. Delighted to be on the panel tonight. I suppose from a personal perspective, quite, you know, from a selfish point of view, I've been OK because, as you know, I was obviously work at the academy, so we are classed as elite elite sport. So like we you know we're fortunate we can go into work. Albeit I'm only in two mornings a week, it's just really to be visual to the players and support them with their ongoing needs, etc. Because the players are basically now in and out, so they're off site by twelve. So from a professional point of view, I feel quite fortunate. And then yeah, personally, I've, I've been okay. I mean, I. I am like an advocate of practice what I preach, so I you know I get into a good routine. I make sure I get up the same time every day. I make sure my self care is good. I make sure I've got the right support mechanisms in my life, and, and I get through it. I mean, I, I think as human beings we are resilient people. Um, but like everybody else, I don't have my days, I have my tough days and, and low moments, and that's the time when you know when you, you need to reach out and get that support that we all need and I think that's the thing with mental health at the moment it's just recognizing that we do all have our low moments and just recognizing that and coming forward and asking for help when uh, when we need it but um, overall yeah Chris used that quote of uh, thriving instead of surviving I was determined from day one to make sure I did that and learning Spanish I've certainly got better cooking and uh, doing all basic things so yeah I've uh, it's a bit, a bit more difficult now. I think most people would agree the third lockdown is the biggest challenge is the weather, of course, lack of light. But as we get towards spring now, we've got more hope. And, yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, springing, getting out a bit more. Good, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm slightly jealous you've got better at the cooking and learning Spanish and things. I <laughs> I really struggled. I, I bought some yeast a while ago, but um, still sitting in the cupboard looking yeah. accusingly at me and saying, come on, everyone else has done it. Um, thank you. Uh, David, David Whiteside, if you could just introduce yourself, please, and say a few words. Yeah, so, uh, hi, David Whiteside. Uh, I am a uh, Norwich City fan uh, living in Birmingham um, for many of my sins. Um, I suppose with me uh, being so far away, the inability to get to games hasn't impacted me as such as, such as someone like Chris, for instance, who season ticket holder goes regularly um being so far away i don't get to go to games that often i get to maybe four or five a year and normal so uh, it probably hasn't impacted me as much as others um what i will say is i'm also as well as norwich city fan i love football and particularly when during the first lockdown when we didn't have any football it was quite difficult um a couple of my friends and ex-colleagues um we have a whatsapp group and we all support different clubs um, from uh, there's a Villa fan in there, there's a Wolves fan, right the way down to a Rushton and Diamonds fan. So all levels. And it's kind of nice to ki- to have kept that going um, and be able to talk about that. And actually, whenever, whenever something good or bad has happened in the football, it's nice to chat to those guys and get their perspective. And actually, we end up having good fun and jokes about it, regardless of whether it's been good or bad. And that's certainly been a, a massive help on my mental health. Um, yeah in terms of the lack of football. Yeah, so. yeah it's been a challenge, hasn't it? But thank you, some good tips there. Um, welcome. Uh, let's move on to Gary Dack, who is the head of safeguarding at the football club uh, at Norwich City. Hello, welcome. 
Hello, Karen. No, you've done Hello. the introduction for me, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm an Orange City fan too. So, yeah, I've been going for so long. Um, it's untrue. Um, yeah, I used Dad used to take me to the middle pen in the old Barclay, you know, 40 plus years ago. So, I've been at the football club for just over a year. Uh -huh. um, green job for me, you know, huge Norwich fan, um, doing something I love. Um, it's difficult times for people currently. That is reflected on the on the work that I see, um, in specifically, you know, young people um, really, really struggling. Um, for me, I've been working from home for most of it, um, have definitely felt cooped up, um, which is a real struggle. Um, and it's this I guess this lockdown may have been more difficult than the rest. Yes, I think so. I think a lot of people feel that. Why do you feel that? Lockdown fatigue. Um, yeah. Just become a bit boring. <laughs> uh, um, so Find you can, sort of the sock drawer. And <laughs> so what I can say, though, is um, as, as a football club, we, um, we're a little bit behind in our uh, safeguarding position. And it has allowed, enabled me to do lots and lots of typing and, and catch up with all the policy strategic work that he's doing. So that's been really beneficial. So again, it's taking positives from negatives. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we really want to try and do this evening. Um, and I know you guys have all got some great positive tips and advice and, and support. Can I just ask you briefly before we move on and introduce um, the, the last of our panellists, um, what exactly do you do? What exactly is the head of safeguarding do? Yes, I've been asked this loads of times. Yeah. You know, what, what is there to do, especially when football's not on? Um, actually, it's a lot bigger job than I'd anticipated. Mm -hmm. So I have four main um, environments. So we have stadium match day environment uh, and staff. Um, we have uh, the academy where I work with Clive very closely um, to do all the safeguarding um, bits around young people there to ensure they're safe. Um, I had, I had to present to the director's board last week, actually, my annual safeguarding uh, report. Um, and I did kind of point out, so I don't think anyone really knows too much what, what I do, but, um, but really to, to point out to say, you know, we've invested so much in our academy. You know, we've got these really talented young people. It's a real envy the academy is. And we've got talented people like Clive, you know, in, in posts. But we have to make sure that it's a real safe place because, um, I'm sure Clive will confirm that a lot of our talent pool does come from like London areas and elsewhere. So we have to make sure it's really safe because parents have then got the confidence to send young people up um, to stay in digs and stuff uh, in Norfolk. Um, so that's a big part of it. I also oversee the um, foundation, you know, brilliant uh, CSF um, foundation where they're they have about 140 plus full-time education students. So we have to make sure they're safe. Um, wow. and, and all the programs they do, you know, they do such a, a valuable job with uh, disabled and, and other, you know, uh, vulnerable groups. So again, we have to ensure that our practice is really safe. So for us to employ safe people and then away they go about their business to ensure that, that there's the confidence of the football club. And finally, we have a number of um, regional development programmes, uh, Ipswich, Cambridge, Peterborough um, and Haverhill. So, you know, kind of like satellite type soccer schools, mm -hmm. colleges. So it's just ensuring that the brand of Norwich City is, is a safe one. The parents and, and users can feel really confident um, about their involvement. Um, awesome. Yeah. yeah, so so a massive remit, basically. Oh yeah, I mean that is, that is a that is, yes, right. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's a lot more than than the match day, and it's just you know the, it's about making our environments safe, welcoming, and inclusive. Absolutely, good stuff. Good stuff. Really interesting job, I should imagine. Really interesting. Thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we are joined by the wonderful Sarah Webb, who's with uh, Norwich and Waverley Mind. Um, I think I'm right in saying. And um, Sarah, can you just tell us a bit about what you do and your experiences in lockdown and uh, how it's been for you so far? Well, um, aside from working for, uh, part time for the health service, I am a volunteer and an ambassador for Norfolk and Waverley Mind. Um, 
what have I been doing in lockdown? Oh my goodness. Um, well, working very hard, obviously. Um, but I have been uh, doing an awful lot of studying. Mm -hmm. um, I've be become really interested and passionate about mental health over the last 10 years. Um, more so recently, in about the last 15 months. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely been a struggle for me. Um, my main struggles have been isolation. I think uh, Gary uh, alluded to that. It's been, I feel like I'm stuck in a rabbit hutch every day. Um, and definitely depression before Christmas was quite real. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that you can recover and I'm very determined to continue with my road to recovery. Um, I'm very much looking forward to getting out of lockdown. Um, and I think this is the third lockdown has definitely been the toughest without a doubt. So, yeah, yeah, I think it has. And, and you know, I have to say congratulations on your recovery and keeping going and, and so far. And uh, we wish you all the very, very best for that, honestly. Um, I, I, talking about that and talking about the fact that we've all found this lockdown so hard and I think you know we're learning stuff from every lockdown from every set of restrictions or whatever but I think uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of people struggle with and one of the questions that is is in the chat um, from uh, Damien um, is uh, he's asked about um, working from home which I think has been something that's been rather challenging um, I've really missed my colleagues. I don't know about you guys. I'm not missing my colleagues, obviously, because you don't know them. But you know, um, I really miss my colleagues. I've really missed just those little moments in life that I took for granted beforehand. That the water cooler moments, you know, where you're just chatting in a banal fashion. So now, if anyone phones my house to try and sell me double glazing or you know whatever, they can't get me off the phone. I'm like, hello, hi, it's so nice to talk to you. Uh, so just a word of warning to any salesman out there. Um, <laughs> so, so what are your top tips? I mean, how do you cope? How do you, I think for me, the biggest, the, one of the hardest things is getting that delineation between work time and play time, you know, when you're surrounded by it. You're all doing amazing jobs and you all have amazing experiences. How do you handle it? Um, you know, I'll, I'll start off with Sarah and then um, anyone that wants to jump in, please do so. Well, I think one of the most important things that I've um, established is uh, like a support bubble. We've heard so much about support bubbles and how important they are. Um, you know, it's important to have key, a key like-minded, positive people that you can connect with that can have a good impact on your mental health and, in, and on your life. Um, and it's always good to try and pick, a, a pick one to have a conversation with someone that you know that can pick you up, someone that you know that knows who you are and what you're about and how you're feeling and that you're not afraid to sort of reach out to. Um, I think that's been a really, really important thing to have uh, is just to, to know that you've got those people around you at all times. Um, and, you know, it's... I, I can't emphasise the importance of that enough, really, just to be in contact with people on a daily basis, just to check in and say, hi, how are you? It's, it doesn't need to be anything more than that, really. Yeah, just a quick chat. It's, it's the frequency of contact, isn't it? What about you, Clive? What about your thoughts? Are you, have you been working, you were saying, mostly at home? Yeah, I want to just echo what Sarah said there. I think I just saw somebody mention the same about structure and routine is so important. I try to get up at the same time every day, right through the week, even weekend. So I'm at 6.45 and then normally starts the day with a walk to get some exercise or a run. I think that's really important. And whenever we talk about mental health, I think it's important to state the fact how important exercise is because exercise releases serotonin. And as, as people would know, we've I've been through, Sarah's been through obviously recently with depression, you get, um, when you get, say, antidepressants as medication, in there is serotonin. So we get it we get it naturally through exercise. So I think that's really important that we get out and exercise and, you know, get the fresh air and get the the, the, the light to just make it, make us feel better. That That's so, so important. And then everything really then is in balance. Like, I speak to the players a lot about um, 
gaming and screen time and minimizing that are clearly your main social connection again which Sarah mentioned there at the moment unfortunately it could be your phone especially our players living away from home so when I'm doing the check-ins it's to make sure okay you need to be connected to your family of course but I would say don't get isolated in isolation if you excuse me if you're, in, if you're in host families do that connection get around them and you know and talk and just you know try and link in what you're really interested in all your hobbies and that still and getting that balance right but of course what's really interesting that i'm sure everybody on this uh, forum will relate to this perfectly and gary's already said about boredom you can quickly get quite bored of a good of a structure i'm saying a good structure but structure then it's mm -hmm. so then it's quite it's like tweaking it so i still get up at 6 45 but I might not go out for a walk straight away. I might do a bit of Spanish straight away. I might actually look at a podcast straight away. I might start work straight away. I've done it this week, actually. And I, I got up at 6.45 and I went for a walk at 9.30 to 11.30. And I came back, had a shower, and by 1 o'clock I was ready to go again for work. So, yeah, routine and structure. And just being mindful speaks to players a hell of a lot about this. That boredom's actually okay. Just, just feel the boredom. And mm. you'll you'll either do two things. You'll be really creative and think, right, I'm going to go and do something. I'm going to go and like bake a cake or, you know, cook something or do something creative. It might be I don't know, do a jigsaw. And but of course, then boredom can have a negative effect. And then if you get bored, you might just like go to bed or sleep too much, or you might start doing what we call self-destruct um, coping strategies. Like you might be doing too much gaming or start like doing on online gambling. So all these things. So always really just promoting healthy talk about with, with the players to make sure they really understand how it can impact on mental health. So I, I always thought, well, I don't get bored. And I, I think when I look at my own life now, my boredom spots normally about 10 o'clock in the evening. I'm too tired to read. I'm too tired to watch something on Netflix. Obviously I'm not tired enough to sleep. I don't want to go outside, do more exercise. So I just, really just lie down listen to a bit of music and then eventually i'll just uh switch off but the, the brain is so complex as everybody relates to i heard a quote a few weeks ago on a podcast to say the brain hasn't really evolved over 2000 years and 2000 years ago it's quite different it? you know we lived in caves and we hunted for prey and we got hunted but now it's like the demands are so much on the brain day to day and of course you know me and gary use this word a lot because we Gary worked closely and the vulnerability comes up every time we're speaking about uh, players needs and so the demands can bring vulnerability and that's but I think vulnerability can be healthy because it's recognizing right you are healthy and the courageous people like again like going back to Sarah's uh, challenges before Christmas that like, come forward and just say I need help here mm. I, I need help and support and recognizing that and for me that's courageous the most mentally tough performers I've work with through my fortunate through my career and I've been fortunate to work with now I can say Champions League and Premier League winners when they're having a bad time they come forward and just say look can you help me because this is just not right and you know can you support me and again it's always around the things I've just talked about routine structure sleep exercise balance hobbies and interests and you can quickly get someone into a very good place um you know with that for sure there's so many things that I want to pick up on there that you've said that are brilliant. And I, I just want to ask you, is, is it changing, do you think, the culture in football? Is it changing? Have you seen a, a, a difference in the way that players will be vulnerable and will allow themselves to come and talk to you? Yeah, definitely. I would say it's a good question, and I'm glad you've asked it, because that just reminds me of just the reality of where we are now. When I first started working in football, if a player came to me with a problem, I would normally have to go to the coach or the doctor and say, this player is not feeling too good today. And uh, you get obviously real frustrating. Well, I just need to man up. I'll be okay. Just get out and train. We're, we're really fortunate now. And I lose count of the amount of times I've done it actually recently. So in the last two and a half years where a player comes in and I can see quickly that he's not right. So I make the assessment there. Okay, you shouldn't be at work today. Um, don't panic. You just, you know, just having a bit of bad time. Give him a bit of advice and technique, some techniques to use, and then give him a bit of time off. And with like between like a week and ten days, they're back in, and they're okay. And he doesn't get questioned. So that's yeah. that's a, that's a massive change of. That's a massive change, yeah. Yeah, and also I, I, player, sorry, player care didn't exist five years ago. Yeah. 
so sports science psychologist player care coming into the coming into the game has been a massive forefront and we're really fortunate at Norwich I can say this because you know we're only not many cl uh, clubs in the country doing this we've got actually full-time player care staff and a full-time psychologist just at the academy oh, so yeah we're really really fortunate and we another word me and Gary use a lot is empowerment and we, we just are empowering the players now just to come forward and again on that day when they're not feeling great just to ask for help and support and you can get that very quickly and yeah it's good I'm really really pleased again again on the two psychology was a tab taboo word 15 20 years ago and it was like oh god if a senior psychologist there's not, there must be something wrong with him and again going back to players i've been fortunate to um work with we've got some young players now and the ones who are doing well <clears throat> they're all booking an appointment regularly to see our psychologists just to see how they can keep developing their mm. psychological development so in 10 15 years ago what's wrong with them if you've seen a psychologist so it's been a massive change i'm so pleased and proud of that I, I think that sounds amazing and I think it sounds so forward thinking and um, much more forward than, than a lot of uh, firms, you know, a lot of private um, businesses and, and stuff that, you know, it sounds like you guys are really leading the way, which is superb. And um, I just want to bring in David on that because I think, um, David, you, you live in Birmingham, you're a data engineer, is that right? I think. Right, yes. Yeah. So, so are you working from home? Are you working at work? How has it been? Are you all Work. So, um, it, it's for me. I, I work from home every day. Um, our office is pretty much shut. The couple of guys go in just to sort of keep things ticking over, but generally it's permanent working from home. Um, one of the things that I struggled with is um, we as a so I work in the software development team, um, and anyone with software development will tell you most they have a stand up at the beginning of each morning to go through what they've done, what they need to do, go through the work they're doing and sort of work like that. So that's really useful because every morning we have a five minute meeting about what we're doing. So we talk to everyone. But one of the biggest things I've struggled with is working in office. If you've got an issue, you can almost just shout over to someone. Hi, can you come help me? Whereas if you're not in the office with them, if you're working from home, it becomes much more of an effort and much more yeah. of a thing to get in contact with them. And although I work, my guys I work with are great, no problems whatsoever with doing it, you always feel that little bit more pressure, that kind of like, are they busy? Am I interrupting them? And it just, it does have, like, either these little things do have an impact um, on that. And it's kind of, it's just kind of dealing with that, understanding it, and kind of almost having to push through it sometimes and forget and try and forget that it's a thing. Um, just want to bring up something that I saw in the chat a minute ago. Um, someone mentioned about all the things that people are doing, like decorating, learning Spanish, and it's a really good thing. Um, and they said, but as long as people are managing, does it matter what they do? And they're absolutely right. As it, yeah, if you want to go and do something big, if that works for you, fantastic. If you just want to sit there and listen to music, because that's what helps you, uh, do whatever you need to to get through. Yeah. It makes no difference to anyone as long as you are as long as you are surviving and you are doing what you want it doesn't matter whether it's massive or whether it's tiny it really doesn't i i couldn't agree more i, I think um, i wanted to bring up a comment which um jack um mentioned earlier which said uh, for me having a routine structure lots of people in the chat saying this routine and structure is really important uh and it's kept me going away from work spending time creating things especially music is the thing that inspires me Oh, and Daniel Farper's soft, beautiful voice, of course, <laughs> which I think inspires as well. Um, uh, some of you did ask, uh, oh, sorry, in the poll we asked, the previous poll, we asked about, do you feel confident that you're doing the right things? And 66% uh, of people answering the poll said, sometimes. I think we're all a bit guilty of that. And I did like when Clive said about the late night TV thing, that you're uh, too tired to go to bed, that you're too tired to do something else. And... I end up doing the bad thing at that point, which is watching another Netflix thing when I shouldn't, you know, uh, which is terrible. Chris, I know Chris Reeve, I know you're a big, big fan of the the structure and, and, and you know, having a routine, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely, Karen. It, it's, it's absolutely paramount and super, super important. And actually, um, I've recently had to really just accept the fact that we all need to innovate our daily habits. We all need to probably change them because they're not going to be the same. And we've probably all been guilty of trying to do the things that we were doing that now don't work any longer. A um, couple of things that I've been doing, just a couple of actionables straight away. 
with the lack of sunlight, I've been taking Vit D3, which has really helped give me some give me some new energy. I've also been uh, reading a page of this book, The Daily Stoic, and I highly recommend you read that. Very, very much well worth the investment. But I think, you know, much like Ben Gibson, you know, at, at the back, trying to get his head up and, and play that, 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 that through ball straight through to Team Ipuki, I've, I've been asking my, myself the question, what can I do to attack this lockdown? So rather than letting it attack me, I'm going to attack it. I'm going to get my head up and I'm going to do something about it. So, um, you know, particularly, uh, you know, in and around the world of social media, as you'd expect me to talk about, I've been... Um, I've been ignoring the noise, as Daniel Fark would say. I've been unfollowing a lot of the accounts that, that, that don't give me good energy. A lot of the people that are uh, moaning and not giving me anything, I'm just removing them from my world. And I'm also proactively going out there and um, following accounts that give me value. Uh, for example, Good News Movement on Instagram, which is talking about the good news at the moment. Yes. Um, but I, th I think a, a, a key quote that is really, really stuck with me in this lockdown is, try your absolute best to control the, the controllables. And what I mean by that is how much media are you consuming on a regular basis that you can't control and you're just letting it impact you? Why are you, why are you giving it time? Why are you watching it? Social media, you're in control. You can mute people, you can mute words, uh, you can unfollow accounts. So I think that's really important. And I think, you know, certainly something that's helped me cope is actually setting myself, and this sounds a bit hardcore, but bear with me here. I'm actually setting myself a target of having some meaningful conversations. I have a set number um, a day where I try and talk to, talk to five people a day that importantly give me value. So not just my family, but anyone that could be a positive influence. I think that's really important. And actually um, just recognizing your, your, your trigger points and understanding, oh, here we go. I'm slipping onto the negative spiral. What can I do differently? Mm. Um, and actually, sometimes that means it's shutting the laptop lid and it's and it's stopping your routine and it's accepting it and it's allowing it, allow it to flow through you and, and, and not let it break you. Um, that's, of course, all easier said than done. But those are the things that have particularly uh, helped me get through this lockdown. But it, it's been incredibly tough. You know, I've had some some dark days, too. And um, and that's why I think I, I really, really love what Sarah said about, you know, actually ha having a support bubble or or having those meaningful conversations, or, as I'm saying. Clive's bang on the money as well, make, making sure that you're, you've are you you've got a routine, but perhaps look at your routine and understand, like, okay, what can I do differently? And I'll purposely change it and mix it up. Um, rather than accepting lockdown and allowing it to hit you, what can you do differently? Um, I think that that would be a, a really fresh way of, of trying to get through the remaining weeks of lockdown. I saw Stuart Lewis uh, comment on the uh, chat and I think he's totally right. Like uh, as uh, as David alluded to as well, look, you know, you don't have to be doing all these all these fancy things, right? But my my honest advice is try and attack it. Be the Ben Gibson. Get your head up and try and play that through ball through to Team Ipuki. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, and Chris. You mentioned social media there, and I think social media is something that we've all probably been guilty of. Uh, you know, interacting with in an unhealthy way at various times over, over lockdown. And, um, you know, that, that sort of thing, I know you were talking about um, before where you, you look at your phone immediately, you get up and, you know, you stop doing that. And uh, and I think that's, that's great advice. I just wanted to ask Gary and, and Clive, um, we've had a question from Ross who talked about how, how the players been dealing with social media during lockdown. Has it affected your interaction with people? And Sophie also asked, how can we safeguard players and, and fans on social media? Obviously a massive, massive issue right now. Yeah, I mean, I'll pick that up first before Gary makes a comment. But yeah, we're fortunate. We've, we've, we work with a company, company called B5 Consultancy and they help us do uh, workshops and support the players with the social media. And I think where that paid off really well for us was during the first lockdown where we know, we know a lot of clubs, so we can, we can talk about it now. Tottenham, Chelsea, Man City, you know, three of the biggest in the, in the country. Some of their players were found vulnerable to breaking social media. Sorry, the, uh, the guide, lock, that lockdown guidelines, but quite poorly. It was actually... They did it through social media where they was actually, you know, promoting, highlighting what they was doing or family friends were. So, so that was quite poor. But Nor Norwich City, we, we were very good. We were, again, we were quite proactive on that. We pay a, like say, this company to support our players with that. So, yeah, I think we're in a real good place with it. We're just, it's always the, just be the players being mindful of what's acceptable 
on lockdown and in lockdown and we said that from 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 day one look, there's people out there struggling sadly um passing away so you've got to be really sensitive whatever you're doing in lockdown be mindful of that so yeah we're, we're really pleased about it i think just away slightly from that there's always going to be you know, the, the most recent players who've graduated into our first team environment andrew omabomadeli tori somatoi and josh martin we're supporting them now making that transition to first team because of course we class them again as being vulnerable because unfortunately unless we support them they know they're going to get through social media they're going to get negativity they're going to get envy and they're going to get jealousy now marcus rashford all for all the good work he's doing unbelievably i mean what saw unbelievably he was actually racially abused online this week but if any of you saw his program bbc i player which i'd recommend 30 percent of the uh, comments on his social media themes are actually negative which is unbelievable but mm-hmm. where he was quite smart because he's a smart kid and he's obviously got the money to be able to do that he's he was paying someone to actually manage that for him and actually made a comment while i expected it so this is what i'm saying to the players you're going to get negativity you're going to get envy you're going to get jealousy you have to accept that and it's like it's always the way i think stephen fry made this comment about like you it's i think i think he, he linked it to a like a swimming pool and you you know you can jump into a swimming pool and all of a sudden you see something in the swimming pool you don't want to like and it puts you off so that's yeah. and that's what related to social media you have a great performance and then one one person says something negative and unfortunately the way the brains evolve we hang on that negative word and we, we focus on that so yeah, yeah. I'm, again i'm quite proud we do a lot of work on that and i know we're, we're in a r- really good place with it and the players are getting the right education and support as a result Fantastic to hear, really fantastic to hear. Thank you, Clive. Um, and Gary, can I ask for your thoughts on the same question, please? Yeah, so I mean, it's really positive to see so our young up and coming players, you know, who are going to be exposed to a lot of hatred. Um, kind of just leading on from Chris's point earlier, you know, I, I think that, that we're all in our own race, you know, as individuals, we are all run our own race. and, and What's good for one person is not good for another. Um, the lockdown periods in particular, there's a lot more time spent online. Um, certainly at, at the football club, we were seeing um, a lot of abusive um, social media content towards a lot of the, the players, uh, which led to, many of you may have seen the mean tweets, um, uh, YouTube that, that was done with Tex and Toddy Cantwell, um, you know, that so had a good. Really, really positive effect. But what was really good about that is that that provoked conversations. Um, I've had, we've been involved a little bit in social media as a football club, and it's about where does our stance lie in relation to that. But um, uh, for the club, you know, if, if, if people are being really hateful online, it's likely if they're coming to our stadium, they're going to be hateful within the stadium, which then creates risk to others. It impacts uh, on the well-being of others, makes people vulnerable. So, I don't know, people on, online may well have seen that, that perhaps the club over the last year have been a, a bit more involved in societal issues. Uh, it may have been noticeable, I don't know. I think we understand as a football club, you know, we've, we've got a fantastic community club. and. You know, we should really harness that and, and our position within the county is such actually, you know, we get a lot of attention so we could uh, send out awareness messages and help people uh, and I think we have to have that responsibility. But, but just going on around the social media, I guess we also, people need to understand what environments are, are, are unhealthy for them. And, you know, if you are particular, spend a lot of time online um, and it is making you miserable, then actually sometimes you have to take some tough decisions and say, I'm going to step away from this. Um, and yeah, to just to, to maintain, you know, people's mental health. Yeah, it, it's, it's an easy fix sometimes, isn't it? You know, to, to look at social media, but it's not necessarily very healthy. And you have to, you know, you have to be disciplined. That takes discipline, you know, because, you know, these type of things are addictive. Um, I, um, I was quizzing my students about how long they spend on their phones and uh, and was horrified by some of their answers sort of eight hours a day 12 hours a day and then i did uh, a check on my own phone and how long i was spending on them yeah, and i'm not going to tell you but it wasn't very clever so it was it was you know voiced by my own petard really 
And can um, I just, just, just add, can I just add, Karen, around social media, around there's a lot of sharing of feelings on, on social media currently, uh, and we get a lot of concern for people. So people contact the club, say, I'm concerned about this fan because what they've been tweeting and, and you know, sharing some real emotion. I think it's really kind of important that, that if people wish to do that, this, it, it's just really helpful to kind of specify that they're safe. You know, I'm feeling really down, but I'm safe. Um, mm. Really, really important. Really important. Um, I, uh, we, we did ask the question um, about um, the stigma stop people from talking about their mental health uh, in the poll. And it sort of whizzed past and I missed the results. But um, judging from the, the comment from Chris saying that that, uh, that poll shows there's so much work to do, so 50 50, um, which was one of the questions that actually was asked beforehand um, by Jade, who said, um, uh, is there anything, you know, I'm a mental health person at work, is there anything I can do to start up a discussion naturally and break the stigma? Um, who wants to jump in with that one? Sarah, you're nodding. Yeah. How, how would you approach that? How, how can we sort of um, get the conversation going? Three simple words. Are you okay? How are you? Is there anything I can do? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be really difficult. Uh, it's just being, uh, showing concern, showing that you care, um, just trying to work out what you can do to support someone. Uh, it's just vitally important just to keep it really simple. Yeah, absolutely. But, but do it. Yeah. Because I think sometimes I want to ask anyone on the panel this, um, sometimes I think we worry about saying the wrong thing. We worry about getting the wording right. We worry about being seen as intrusive or um, judgmental or or not supportive in any way. And we, we, we're frightened because we don't know how, because we're not used to having these discussions. We're frightened of getting it wrong. So we don't do it. Yeah. Um, I, so I, 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 that, that's a good point. But I think Sarah's right in the fact that sometimes it doesn't need to be a big thing and like we almost when we want when we see that someone might be struggling or when we see someone needs help or we think they might need help we, we could be wrong it doesn't need to be a big thing it doesn't need to be an intervention style sit them down and things sometimes just walking up to them and just saying hey how's your day going might be enough to kick that start the conversation and nine times out of 10, it probably is enough to start the conversation. And then you can take it from there. And it, conversations about mental health, once they get going, tend to flow naturally. Getting them going can be difficult, absolutely. Mm. But they then tend to, and people start opening up and start almost laughing and joking about it, which is, mm. which in a, in a very macabre way is a good thing because it kind of eases their tension over it. But yeah, it often can just start with a, Hey, how's things? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyone else on the panel? Any thoughts about that? How to get the conversation going? Because it, se it seems, judging from the poll, it's still something we all find a bit difficult. Yeah, I think we, 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 need, we need to encourage individuals to be actively involved around discussions around mental health and, again, talking around their own mental health challenges. Because everybody, everybody has them. That, that, I mean, that's absolute fact. We all, we all have mental health. Challenges. Interesting. The, the the poll question you just put up there, and again, it's a good reminder for me, really, because I always say this to staff and to to players. The you know when you open up to somebody, I mean, the three most important things that person needs to do is one, listen. I mean, that because listening is a skill. They need to listen. They need to be empathetic. So empathetic can be. I typically, when I speak to a player, I just like that like, could be how are you. As um, Sarah just said there, and I might not say anything for five, ten minutes, and then, you know, I've had players crying with me, and I'm, the first thing I will say is, like, I'm, I'm not surprised you feel the way you do, given what you've just told me. So that's empathy. And then yeah. also being non-judgmental. Non non the, the worst thing you can say to someone when they open up to you is, like, God, why do you feel like that? Why don't you just pull yourself together? And I can't believe you feel like that. And that stops that person open up so that's the three skills you need and that to, to be developed and I would say to our staff that the more you can upskill yourself and that you're going to bet you're going to be as a professional person so I think talking is fantastic and you need to do that but again it's trusting the person who you open up to I and mean, we all know we'll have someone who, who's got those skills and that mm. we're open up, we, we will open up to but 
but also unfortunately you know when we're, when we're talking we're not all, we're not asking for advice sometimes we're just talking because we want to talk and you know just tell someone how we how we feel and you know the last thing we're looking for is advice clearly sometimes especially in my job i have to give advice because 16 17 year old boys are expecting me to you know give them some advice or some kind mm. of strategy but yeah we have we've appointed mental health ambassadors at the academy and their players who've just shown an interest in doing that and again we always talk about i don't care who the players talk to really as long as they talk to somebody and it's as simple as that so there's no better um person to speak to someone again someone who's in the change rooms around them and giving them that skills and the training to you know to be able to recognize the signs and you know, the more the better awareness we've got the better it's going to be um for everybody because if one person helps somebody then everybody's cared for so yeah, yeah. T- talking is you know so so important but it's also the skill set of that person we've given that kind of free um yeah it should be like that almost that responsibility in a way and honor and privilege that someone's actually talking to them and opening up about their feelings absolutely give it the time and the space as well isn't it i i think um peter in the comments says um uh, there's often concern of how do i respond if they say i'm not doing okay which is why the uh, the mental health first aid course is so good um he recently completed it and it was helpful in a stressful situation i i did it a couple of years ago actually and i have to say um, it really is a, a superb um can you just tell people a little bit about that if people want to find out a bit more about that sarah i don't know sorry. You broke up a bit there, sorry. Sorry, I was just saying about the mental health first aid um, <laughs> course, yeah. It's yeah, a su- superb thing. Well, well, mental health first aid course was one of the best things that I did. And I actually did that as um, at Norwich City Football Ground probably about four years ago, something like that. But it, it just really did demonstrate how someone's life can change just in... A small space of time just by one thing um and how the one thing can affect you and then it sort of like linked in and brought in other issues and then you could almost picture this person's life becoming more and more difficult as as more and more layers of stress or things were going on um it's all you know it de- definitely was really worthwhile i learned masses from it um and it's something you know something definitely worthwhile investing in good good um ian uh, says as well it's a really really good course uh, sorry i'm trying to get through as many comments as i can they keep coming up so uh thriving workplaces thank you kat says they offer um, mhfa training and just put a link in the, the chat there um, and Jack says, as a well-being, are currently running free mental health training every month to increase understanding about mental health, create a supportive environment, and how to talk to people who may be struggling. Uh, called community champion training. So get in touch uh, if you or your workplace might benefit. Great stuff. Uh, good. Okay. Um, let's try and just squeeze in um, a few more questions. So uh, Peter's got a question, I guess, for. Clive, Gary, um, when you release a young player or a student, what mental health do you give? What mental health support do you give at the time when there might be initial sense of failure, rightly or wrongly? How do you? Yeah, of course, that? that's a crucial part of it. And again, we, we pride ourselves in that to make sure that um, actually it used to be called the exit strategy. I'm trying to get away with that terminology now because I think that puts a negative slant on it. Mm. So it's almost like a next steps. And I, th- I, th- I think a bit real positive for Norwich City is that we develop young players and we've, there's a clear pathway to the first team. However, clearly, you, some of the players just need to understand that, you know, their pathway could be if they're a fullback right now, the, the first team have obviously recruited good fullbacks and we've also produced good, fat, good fullbacks in the case of Max Aaron. So that, that's just clear there that the, the pathway to the first team is blocked. But it, all, it always comes down to one thing, really, and it's just, managing their expectations so if their expectations are to get into the first team and to get in ahead of say max aaron's and that's not going to happen it's it's obviously just managing that accordingly because if you don't meet your expectations clearly then you are going to be disappointed as, as, a, as a minimum 
So it's all every time I speak to them, I do one to one with the players. It's, it's actually what your goals are. Are they smart? Are they realistic? Who's supporting you on that journey? Are you getting the feedback from the coaches? If not, why not? How, what are you doing about it? Are you reflecting on your performances? You know, just be, just really being realistic to make sure that they are s- supported. And then, of course, also that the other thing to consider is just the, the the people around them, the parents, their friends, and their family's expectations. So it's it's not an easy journey at all. It's not, and as we know, m- many are taken into academies, but few are chosen for the first team. The numbers are so small, but you can always use that. And I'm always honest with them and just say, look, you know, what what have you been told about this season, next season? Are you are you going to still be with us? What are you do about you doing about it? So, yeah, it's just been really, really re- realistic. And we always we always tell the players early. That's the one thing I was quite proud of when I started Norwich that I changed quite early because I saw such bad practice where players would be told in April that's you done in four weeks, and then you know it's, mm. they almost go through like a grieving cycle, and it's really really difficult to help them. So we tell them well before Christmas now, so they still go through that disappointment that cycle, but then within by November, they're refocused and they're ready to um, focus again on their, their next step. So, and we do a lot of work on dual careers as well. So we're trying to get them to focus on a dual career aspect. Again, the philosophy of being, doesn't matter how successful you are, you're going to need two careers. But the average football career, believe it or not, is only eight years. So, and there's a Tyro Mings, again, Marcus Rashford, uh, Bellerin at Arsenal. There's three players who have got dual career options. But they're also there's a correlation between good performance on the pitch. So what does that tell you? That their hobbies and interests are good away from football, which makes them then refocus on the pitch and start to enjoy it a bit, bit more. So that's really important. And we've got some of our players at the moment at the academy. Louis Lomas, who plays for the Twenty Threes, him and his girlfriend have opened a floristry business. So he has great great joy sending me his flowers on the WhatsApp in his spare time. Another lad's on about being a uh, being a barber and, and cutting air, and obviously not in lockdown, but us looking to do a course. So, yeah, we're really proactive. That's so, really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to answer the question, yeah, there is a lot of support. And we do a lot of work on that, and yeah, we do pride ourselves to make sure that we get that right. And we've got an alumni group as well, where we keep in touch with the players, and yeah, just make sure they're supported. You know, just a simple WhatsApp message now and again, just say how is everything? Do you need any? any support and like Delia Smith said and I'm a great advocate of this great quote once an Norwich player always an Norwich player and you can see that I feel that as a club I'm not from the area but I've lived here two and a half years and I think wow this is a special club for that real family orientated yeah. every club can say that but Norwich City do get that right and that's obviously from Delia Michael Down that just shines through the club I think and I, yeah, sorry I Karen agree. if I could come in um, yeah, I, I, yeah I mean I what is it Clive is it about one in 15 actually get through so it's something about nationally, is it, you know, that academy kids that only won the breakthrough to, to the first team and stuff? Oh, it's a lot. No, it's a lot. Stats, it's from stats, yeah, around that. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's an incredibly competitive process for these young people who, who from the ages of six, it's been their entire life. So at the point for them to a club to say, right, actually, you know, you don't have a future with us. That could be absolutely crushing for, for, for that young person. And and obviously then it creates other potential vulnerabilities. And Clive and I do a lot of work around this. Um, the, the young people, if they don't have something else to go on to, they're really exposed to filling that void, which it could be criminality, you know, it could be um, radicalization, all sorts of things. Um, really difficult. And in, filling, in terms of filling that void, obviously you're giving them a lot of support and guidance in that. Um, and I think that was one of the questions that came up in the chat, uh, you know, the support for young players trying to find other clubs or trials or whatever. I just want to widen that out, if I can, to, to the rest of the panel about, you know, I, I teach young people and I've seen the effects of this pandemic on their mental health. Um, lots of young people that I know are suffering. Um, how do we help uh, engender the conversation about mental health with young people? How do we best provide them with the skills and the toolkit to be able to have uh, helpful conversations with each other and support whoever wants to jump in on that one? What do you think? 
Everyone's looking at me blankly. Um, well, I, I, I think, you, you, I mean, the younger players, you're talking younger players. I mean, I, we're doing something now about players between nines and fifteens. We've got like leadership groups set up. And um, I, I was absolutely amazed by their level of awareness around things like mental health. It's incredible. Even around things like um, LGBT plus, that was, that was just the awareness was, was staggering. And they were talking about mental health. And there's no, no exaggeration. They were talking about some of the things we've mentioned tonight. Yeah, you've got to have a routine and you've got to have hobbies and interests and you need to exercise and don't be on your gaming all day because you get addicted. And I was thinking, these guys are 10 or 11. So there's a lot of good work going on. And like I say, I, I, I said after, this is absolutely brilliant. This is really an, an untapped resource that we really need to, you know, do more, do more work with. And one of the best things I've seen at Norwich actually last year was an under-15 player do a mental health workshop to the under-15s. Honestly, awesome. if, yeah, if he was, if, it, if that was being assessed as a teacher, I said to him after, if that was a teaching assessment, you know, passed, it was unbelievable. He was actually stopped it. He was going, so this point here, what do you think? And he was actually, the way he was engaging the audience was absolutely incredible. Now, it, out of interest, that boy was actually released this season. So he was just not obviously deemed not uh, talking about pathways that, at the level to get through to the next pathway. But that boy is going to be really, really successful at whatever he puts his mind on, which is, you know, full credit to him so yeah That's going back to just get the children talking they've got that is their knowledge base especially from my experience at the academy is very impressive i think right. i think for me karen it's, it's really important to um to to help kids understand that when you show vulnerability it's actually a tremendous strength to have and i think we need to inject that more into society showing vulnerability um, you know, we're, we're seeing um, people of, of an older age being being brave enough to do it. Darren Eady, for example, on our Talk Norwich City podcast, I'd wholeheartedly recommend that, literally breaking down on camera. Um, but I think kids are still, you know, scared of showing vulnerability. And I think it's it's about allowing them to have the space and time to be OK about it. And, um, you know, I think, I think you know, Clive spoke there, t touched upon um, thinking cycles. And that's something I'm tremendously passionate about. And I'm always on a personal mission to help any any young person particularly deal with grief. And for those of you that don't know my story, my mum died in 2007 of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer when I was 14. And I wasn't really shown away. I wasn't, and, and actually as a 14 year old, I wish there was someone that had said, these are the key pillars in place that, that you need in your armory, Chris, to get through this rather than just wandering through that grief. And, and I think it's about exposure as well. So, you know, allowing, young people you know getting young people for example in retirement in retirement homes and, and asking old pe older people you know what do you regret in your life and you know something incredible that i did was i went to zach after my mum died about three years after i went on gavin drake from mindspan his um his course he's got a book as well called mindspan really recommend that he works with not city csf uh, still to this day but i went out to zambia and uh, worked in a in an orphanage and a local school and it gave me such a tremendous viewpoint of like real perspective. And I really think that, and this is me just being totally honest here. I don't think kids are exposed enough to mental health. I don't think kids are exposed enough to these, 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 what I would call critical conversations. And it's really important to, you know, you know, pra you know, practice what you preach, show vulnerability yourself as a parent or a teacher or a lecturer or a business leader, whether that be to kids or staff, I think showing vulnerability is key. But a massive thing for me with kids is helping them understand um, the, the, the full picture and not being afraid to expose them to it. As a 14-year-old, mm. what happened to me, I just wish that, that, that someone had shown me, here are, the, here are the three doors that you can go down, Chris, um, rather than letting them work it out and, get, and potentially get bullied for showing vulnerability. Because in schools are brutal. You know, I mean, personally, I didn't have a great time at school. I mean, I, I was picked on for you know, being the outspoken guy with, with dodgy glasses on and an Norwich fan. But, you know, I, th I think it's just, yeah, I, I think that's really important. And, um, you know, telling kids it's okay to, to, to show that vulnerability um, and actually asking them regularly. Um, you know, don't just, you know, be proactive, not reactive, something that I'm telling Daniel Falk to do with his subs at the moment, you know. We, but, but we should be proactive rather than reactive with mental health when it comes to younger kids, Karen. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I mean, there's great work by people like Nelson's Journey uh, being done in, in terms of handling grief with young people. Uh, a friend of mine lost her brother when she was 16 and was her parents were so caught up in their own grief that they didn't have time to explain to her what was going on. And I think it was only many years later that she got to unpick that. So I think acknowledging that young people are having these really, um, you know, really sort of intense feelings and experiences um, is something we need to do much more, I think. I think there's still a lot of work on that to be done. Um, wanted to ask you, um, all of you, and, and Chris, I'll start off with you. Matt asks, what I think is a really good question in, in the um, chat that says, how important do you think people's expectations of themselves has an influence on their mental health? And what advice can be given to manage that better? Yeah, that's a, it, it's, it's a real double-edged sword, right? Because, you know, I'm sure loads of people in here are very, very, I mean, most people that are on here now, they've clearly got the, the drive to improve or have personal development in this area. So it's almost sometimes it's, and, I, and again, Clive spoke about this. I think it's understanding the difference between expectations and, and agreements is really important and mm -hmm. having an agreement with yourself versus an expectation. Because of course, Clive said, you know, that, that can only go one way. So I think it's, I think changing the language is really important. Um, and I said it right at the start, particularly with lockdown, let's make it super relevant. You, ha you have to not put too many expectations on yourself at all. You know, have, have two key priority tasks for the day and everything else is a bonus, for example. I, I work in baselines a lot. I'm, I'm a managing director of a social media agency and, and, and I'm always setting what I call baselines of activity. So if I hit this, I've achieved today, I've done well today and, I, and, I, and everything else is, is a bonus. Um, you know, and much like, you know, I keep with these North City analogies, but it's true. I think, you know, we, we're just trying to get promoted. Yeah. So as long as we're in second spot, it's OK. But you know what? If we win the league, that's going to feel absolutely incredible. So, you know, not having your expectations too high, but not having your expectations low. And, and actually, when you're in a coaching situation or, or a mental health conversation with someone, it's about, in my opinion, in my experience, helping them set agreements with themselves versus you telling them that they need to hit X, Y, Z and, you know, not setting, you know, massive targets at the moment during lockdown. It is, as Stuart Lewis alluded to this, it is about just getting by at the moment and, you know, you are enough. You're doing well. You're doing so well. You are enough. Absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, it said the panellists can't uh, join in the polls. Are we going up? We're definitely going up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 110%. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I thought something about uh, Chris's point makes a really fantastic point. I think it's about reframing thinking, and Chris has really shared this personal adversity that he's, you know, he, he's gone through. But it's about harnessing that adversity that people have faced and then turning that into a positive. It's really easy for me to say, but you know, those type of situations kind of create resilience. Um, Clive and I have spent some time over the last couple of days talking about resilience um, yeah. for, for some of our young people. I, I, I shared with Clive that, that um, I was taught symmetry at school, never once used it in my entire adult life. I wish I'd sat in a, in a resilience lesson, you know, because that helps you get through a, a, as an adult. But um, yeah, reframing thinking and, and creating like almost like a coping tank. And it just needs to be filled up. With I love that. That's a, I love that. A coping tank. Uh, on that, I'm just going to ask, um, Chris asked uh, about an hour ago, actually, sorry, we're trying to get through all the questions. Um, does it help you? Do you have a checklist of things to use that you know will help when you're in a tough place mentally, when that tank needs refilling? What do you refill it with? Go on, Chris. For me, massively, Karen. I mean, and something, again, that I learned on the Mindspan course, you can get the book as well. Please do that. It's really important that you do. In my opinion, it will really help make a gratitude note on your phone so when i'm feeling like shit excuse my french i always i just take a moment to read my gratitude um, note on my phone you can do this in a diary as well i've got a roof in my head i've got a lovely fiance i've got two cute cats norwich at top of the league all of the little things that just list all of those little things and, and read them when you feel down and I, I promise you i promise you it helps i think quite often we have to-do lists and it's quite a, it's quite a negative thing but you know, actually switching that to these are the things that make me happy and I'm going to tick those things off, if that makes sense. And again, I use this phrase over and over again, be proactive, not reactive. So make that make a, a new daily habit of reading your, your, your gratitude note, your gratitude journal once a week, for example, to make sure you're not slipping into that negative spiral of thinking. You know, Gary's 
still are there, you know, it is about re reframing and thinking about the way we think. A lot of people hide from that, you know, and it's so important to actually just spend some time thinking about the way you think and understanding your trigger points. And sometimes that comes from, and again, it comes from showing vulnerability and asking people, you know, what do you think about the way I'm coping with this? And as long as it's a safe space to do so, like Sarah's saying, a, a support bubble, I think that that's something that would be well worth considering. Right. Yeah. I'd add to that as well. My, my, my own kind of uh, coping strategy is is exercise. I, without getting too scientific, I've mentioned serotonin. When when you when you're in a, when you're in a good space, everything's going well. You've got a lot of serotonin it, it, it flowing from your body and from your mind. And then when you're stressed, you, your serotonin is depleted. And I, I said this the other day. I said this quite a lot to a colleague. Right, I've got to go now because I need to. Me serotonin is depleted. I need to go out for a walk and then. Two hours later, I'm back in on a call, and you've got seen completely different. And it's that, so I can I know exercise works for me, and there's no bit better. And I always say to the lads, lads, right, it's dark, it's raining, it's windy. I still go out, go get out for a brisk walk. And this is even talk to lads because their excuse is, well, we've trained all morning at the academy. I said, yeah, but then you've got the rest of the day just to sit in your room. Don't do it. So, and then sure enough, they go out and they send me pictures and videos of them out on walks and how do you feel? Yeah, I feel a lot better. So that I mean that is good advice because I know I can I know it works for me so and you know, exercise is so crucial. Yeah, it it is, isn't it? Um, Sarah, what about you? What what do you fill up your tank with? Well, I've kind of thought about developing a mental health toolkit or a toolbox, um, and I think that's really worked well for me. So, you know, it's looking at what you can put in that toolbox. It's a bit like a first aid kit. I don't think we've got a mental health first aid kit, have we? Um, probably Should not. Have. No. But we've, we've all got plasters and safety pins. Um, so, you know, it's looking to f looking at developing a toolbox and what sort of tools you can put in it. And also regular maintenance of those tools. Um, not being afraid to get rid of the ones that you don't want or you don't need. Um, or that don't work um, and always looking to develop new tools um, um, as part of a coping strategy. I think it's well worth investing your time in just thinking about something really simple like that. Yeah, as, as Clive was saying earlier, tweaking your routine and, you know, kind of just, just maybe changing things up a bit. Um, good, thank you. Any other tips and advice on that? We've got some uh, lovely comments in there that uh, Pat says Action for Happiness, which is a great website, isn't it? They do a calendar as well with a monthly, you know, kind of one nice thing to do every day, which is superb. Uh, Christine says she's started practicing daily gratitude and somebody else earlier was saying about a joy diary, which is lovely. Uh, Cat's mental health first aid kit would contain her trainers, joy diary and pen and mobile to connect. That's really cool. I love, I love the idea of this mental health first aid kit. I'm going to put mine together. There might be chocolate involved in it somewhere. I'm sure. um, uh, we've implemented first aid box in our class with strategies to help children work faster. We should have one as adults too. And sleep, yes, sleep is so important. How do we, you know, with all the stuff that's going on, how do you guys tune out and um, how do you get the best night's sleep? David, what do you do? You're nodding uh, there. Uh, I, I'm laughing slightly at this. Uh, so one of the things that I, I, I am very lucky in this regard that I don't have a problem sleeping in any way, shape or form. Um, I I get a decent night's sleep and I'll quite happily go to bed at 10 and get up at 7 the next morning and it won't affect me. Um I have had a couple of issues recently, um, just kind of drift rather than when, once I'm asleep, I'm fine. But it was something as simple as actually, um, it was my partner's birthday at the end of January and I bought her a joke eye mask. Um, and actually I, I, I wore it once um, in bed and actually it really helped. So I bought myself an eye mask and it kind of, what I was finding was when I opened my eyes, when I couldn't sleep, what little light there was suddenly hit me and woke me up and started my brain thinking about various things that made no difference to me whatsoever, but just kind of kept me awake. So all I did was buy an eye mask and I've worn it I've, for like past week and it's been just, it kind of stopped that bit of waking up that I was doing and kind of helped me get to sleep a bit quicker. Um, yeah, I'm a big yeah. fan of those too, yeah. One thing uh, I will say is seeing a couple of people who I know have had trouble sleeping 
it's amazing how much the lack of sleep, even just an hour less a day than you would normally get, how much that can have an effect on you. It mm. really is phenomenal how much that can change you. Yeah, absolutely. Good sleep is very important. What about though, if you've, you know, sadly, lots of people have been furloughed, lots of people have lost their jobs, businesses, um, you know, it, it's really difficult sometimes, isn't it? We know the things we should be doing, as we said earlier in the, in the, um, in the poll you know we said earlier about we're not always good at doing them we know what we should be doing we're not always good at doing them you know we, we were asked a question offline earlier before we came on about you know suggestions for healthy activities or things to help manage that dead time as the, the person put it after a setback the, the person recently lost their job uh, and anxiety is building it's really hard to keep that positive mindset uh, and just keep those routines and keep doing the good things that we know will help us isn't it it's really tough. What advice can you give the person that got in touch with us? Was that to me, sorry? Or? Uh, to any of you, really. To anyone who wanted to step in, sorry. I think, so I, I think the, uh, just want to touch, uh, I'm not sure if this answers the question or not, but someone's put in the chat about sleep hygiene. Mm -hmm. in terms of your environment around you when you're trying to get to sleep. Everyone is very different. Um, I... It, it when I lived on my own one of the things I liked was a bit of background noise to fall to fall asleep to um certainly that isn't ideal for everyone um my partner couldn't sleep if there was noise anything a pin drops and it wakes her up but for me a bit of background noise used to just kind of send me off to sleep a little bit um they've put uh, in the same chat they've put about difference like light sounds and smell and stuff so I think if you're struggling to sleep as a result of thinking um and as a result of your mental health, it, it can be a vicious cycle. So the first step is trying to find things that will help you to sleep. And certainly the first thing is one of the easiest things is try changing your environment. Leave a light on if you want, um, if it helps you. Try some noise in the background um, with, I don't know, Spotify on your phone or with a timer on to turn it off. Try those. They may not work, but at least you're trying something to, to start the change. If, it, if, if your current situation isn't working something needs to change it might be very small it might be big but until you start you don't know cool and uh damien's put in the chat the headspace app actually which is is a good one as well very quickly any other comments from the, uh, the panel i'm conscious we've gone a bit over on the time sorry but i could talk I to you guys all day sorry karen i think anxiety is, is a real like difficult area for sleep in particular um Somebody said to me once, like, try counting from 102 backwards in threes. Um, tried that one a couple of times. Um, <laughs> always fell asleep before I got to zero. So that, you know, a good little tip. But yeah, anxiety in particular, you know, has a real impact on sleep. Yeah, so just all of the things to just try and um, sort out your sleep, sort out your sleep routine in order to help yourself. It, it's that vicious cycle, isn't it? Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'm going to listen to I think one of one of the attendees is an ex colleague of mine who's put a playlist on. I'm going to have a listen to that. Brilliant, brilliant. Good, glad to hear it. Uh, okay, so I uh, sadly I think we we're just about out of time. Can I just ask you all for one takeaway, one positive thing that really helps you? Um, because we'd be nice to to leave everyone on a high. I think um, particularly. With regards to the lockdown, you know, what, what thing are you really doing that's really helping you? If I can start with you, please. Um, sorry, Gary, if I can start with you, please. Oh, sorry, it was me. I was just replying to, to Matt. So, um, so one thing, <laughs> I would, all I would say is, is I guess, that, that with any coping mechanisms that, that, that anyone uses, just to be really safe using them, you know, uh, again, I say this to some of the, some of the more... Um, some of the children that we have that are really struggling you know that that you know if you're involved in safe self-harm be as safe as you can if that is your coping mechanism i think we have to be really realistic it doesn't really help saying just don't do that so you just have to say to people be as safe as we can same goes with drugs sex alcohol you know it is about if that is your coping mechanism just be as safe as you can doing it thank you and sarah yours uh Downtime, rest, um, exercise, uh, just switching off as much as possible, um, and learning to say no. 
yeah no need to say no i think that's fantastic advice uh something i need to take as well um david if you could please yeah uh, i'm not sure this is the best word I, I don't like this word but it's the best one i can use distractions um during lockdown i've been learning new skills i've been learning various technologies and programming languages building a website um trying to learn piano um just distract to distract me from ironically downtime which is one of the worst things for me i don't like downtime because it sends me off on the deep end so i'd rather keep right. busy but this is the point everyone's different mm. so yeah for me it's all about distraction what can i do that is enjoyable that will stop me thinking about other stuff absolutely yeah as you said we are all different we just need to be kind to ourselves don't we uh, and recognize as chris said i think earlier you know you might just have two things on the to-do list that day if you can get them done you know that's it you're a winner um clive yeah I think, I think if you are struggling there'll be a lot of people on here who are, who are struggling day to day i mean the advice i give to the players on that is plan every hour of every day don't leave anything to chance have a healthy balance between hobbies and interests things you enjoy doing even like having naps having rests and just just keep faith it's difficult to do anything without faith i mean and just very simplistic simplistic for me Every day now is getting a little bit lighter. Spring is on the way. The bad weather's going to turn and we'll get more light back in. And we're all better with more light and in the spring and the summer. So, yeah, just, just hang in there. And build on your strengths as well. Build on your strengths. Yeah, hang in there and build on your strengths. I think, you know, tomorrow is another day, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, tomorrow is another day when we're still top of the league and having a laugh. And Chris, on that note, what, what's your top tip, please? I've got three and that's okay. I'm going to break your rules a little bit. I think, um, you know, really thinking about how you can, again, like let's use that, that, that terminology of watch your through ball through to Timu Puki. So own your social media, mute. Like, so what I mean by that is muting accounts that don't give you value, go and follow new accounts. Think about what you're consuming that is just noise and, and just remove as much noise as possible. Secondly, um, I think it's really important to create new daily achievable habits, whether that be reading one page of a book, which I've linked in the chat if you're interested. Um, it might be going out for a run or, or, or even just a, just a five minute walk around the neighborhood. Um, and then lastly, Karen, I think um, making a new habit of practicing daily gratitude um, has been a massive game changer for me and will help you out of a hole should you get in one. Brilliant, absolutely. I think um, the, the whole thing about uh, sorry practicing daily gratitude is is just superb isn't it it's, it's noticing the small things and i think sometimes the the nice thing if you can say that about lockdown is that oh my god never in my life have i been more excited to go for a walk and the possibility of going for a walk and bumping into another person on route it's just too much sometimes it's you know uh, so the little joys and the little the little wins just celebrate those i think is really really important isn't that um and yeah talking little wins and celebrating those fingers crossed and we're having a wonderful time my top tip would be to um keep watching daniel and the boys and keep listening to as somebody said his lovely uh, sultry tones was it sultry it might have been i don't know if that's me um so <laughs> I uh, just wanted to say, wow, thank you so much to all the panelists and to everybody who's taken part tonight. There's some amazing, I've just been, I do apologize, I've been trying to read out as many as I can, but there's been so many fantastic tips and hints and bits of advice uh, and shared experiences. So thank you all for being so, so wonderful. Um, it's uh, it's just important to point out that um, help is out there all the time, not just for the Time to Talk Day. Um, and the Canaries Trust mental health team are out there via email and Twitter. Um, you see that on the, the poster uh, and stuff has been put in the chat as well. Um, and they're able to signpost people every day. They do amazing work. And I think, you know, I think big massive round of applause to Chris for organising this and the Canaries Trust. Um, big massive round of applause to all our wonderful panelists so thank you thank you thank you thank you uh, it's been superb uh, just to tell you guys you've been fantastic as well and please do consider joining the canaries trust if you can they organize amazing things um, amazing events uh, several times a year um, and also the uh, norwich city fan social club are hosting an online mental health event on march the 11th and you can get details on their website which is ncfsc.co.uk 
uh, or via their Twitter, okay? Um, but keep talking. It's been great to be talking to you all. It's been really lovely. I'm feeling the love in the room. I'm feeling like I haven't had a hug for so long, but I'm feeling it now. So thank you all very much indeed. And thank you for the top tips. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Uh, and we'll see you soon uh, with a great big trophy in our hands, hopefully. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. Take care. Thanks, all.